Welcome to the SB Grid YouTube channel. Software tutorials by developers. Lectures by structural biologists. Unique content brought to you by SB Grid. So thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Yes, my name is Lisa and I'm a postdoc now with Gabe Lander. And so today I'll be giving you all a primer on how cryoam became so hot. And so I'll be focusing on the vitrification and sample preparation process that has allowed us to be able to visualize proteins of interest at very high resolution with very little sample. And so I got my PhD at Berkeley where I worked with Dr. Eva Nogales on microtubule regulation. And so here I was very interested in how different chemical modifications as well as microtubule associated proteins were binding the ultrastructure of the microtubule and stabilizing it or regulating it. And with that, I actually had the chance to work directly with one of Eva's favorite postdocs, <laughs> Gabe Lander, who she trained personally and raved about all the time. So I was so honored to have the opportunity to do my postdoc with, with Gabe himself. And so here uh, with Gabe, I am focused on molecular machines. And so specifically, uh, inner mitochondrial membrane proteins that play an important role on in mitochondrial proteostasis. And so sample preparation for us is critical. What detergents we use, what type of functionalized grids we apply, and then our vitrification conditions are essential for being able to visualize highly dynamic and, and often heterogeneous samples uh, and give us the information, the resolution information that we need to make uh, important conjectures about the work that we're interested in. And so assuming you have a, a sample purified and ready to go, uh, during this talk, I will be highlighting uh, the steps essential for preparing your sample. And so what I'm highlighting here, uh, shown in white are the blot, uh, blotting pads. And then in gray is your tweezers that have locked on to a, a grid of interest. And so in our lab, we use copper grids and gold grids. And so we play around with the different uh, layers that we add to the grids in order to create an environment where you have your sample of interest now in liquid, a buffer of interest that allowing it to now stick to your grid of, um, that you've prepared. And so we use open hole, we use gold, uh, particularly in the, in the lab, and then uh, we widely use uh, graphene oxide grids. And I am very happy to talk about why that is uh, in our lab. And so with that, you have a rapid vitrification process of your sample into liquid ethane that you then wash in liquid nitrogen and it's ready to be imaged um, under the scope and, and you're ready to get your, your exciting images. <laughs> and so here I'm highlighting our vitrobot, which is the tool that we use to prepare our samples. And I want to contrast that um, especially financially with the manually plunger, manual plunger that we've actually developed in our lab. And so um, I want to highlight how exactly we prepare our samples. And so what you can see in this um, um, video, here you have the blot paper uh, that you're using to then carefully blot away your sample um, from the grid. And the grid is, is being held by the tweezers, which is now yeah, rapidly going into liquid ethane. And so what's really essential there is that the time that your sample is exposed to the air is limited. That, that's really important for us. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. And so again, assuming you have good biochemical preparation and your freezing um, has been optimized, there's really only two reasons that your cryo-EM preparation should fail, or your sample preparation um, is less than optimal. And that's one, this interaction with the air-water interface in particular, and then fluid shearing forces during wicking, during that process of blotting away your sample. And so what exactly happens during vitrification? What, what, what you're seeing here are your particles uh, via Brownian motion moving along or within this, this liquid, um, your buffer that you've now applied to the grid. And so during blotting, what happens is you're blotting away a large portion of that liquid and hoping that your sample of interest, your, your particles are being nicely distributed within that layer of liquid left over between the, the grids. And so here I'm, I'm highlighting an example grid that is wholly carbon um, um, to, to orient you, you all. 
And so what are some problems? Uh, let me, let's walk through the problems that you can run into. So first, what you might have is that your sample is too thick. And so um, your, yeah, your sample is way too, too thick and then essentially above this optimal range between 15 to 100 nanometers. And that really varies based on your sample. You can also see that your, your um, layer is too thin. And so you're losing um, your, you're, you're losing your sample and you're seeing a lot of your, your sample actually aggregate along the edges of the holes. So that's an example I'm highlighting here that we've seen. Um, you can also run into issues with aggregation if it's being pushed towards the edge of the hole um, uh, or you're at the air water interface. And so at the air water interface, you're more likely to see denaturing of your protein. Uh, this is the same image highlighting that you can have both aggregation and denaturing occur um, at the same time. Uh, you can also have preferred orientation. So this is something that Gabe actually saw early in during his PhD. I'm highlighting an example from a, a, one of his early papers in 2009. So it's something that our lab has been thinking a lot about in terms of how to overcome this issue. Um, and so you're seeing your sample essentially stick to the air water interface, which is absolutely less than optimal, limited views, hard to process that sample. And so, and then the final issue you can run into is you don't see your sample at all. Maybe it was all wicked away and that's very unfortunate as well. And so here, here's a, a blank image, your, your, your protein is completely gone. And so how can we overcome these issues? So during the Q&A, I would love to uh, really prepare you guys for how to overcome any of these issues. So I have additional slides on how, what I've seen people do in order to overcome these issues, such as tilting the stage, uh, improving your processing pipeline that's more downstream, uh, but mainly functionalizing the grids, playing around with different detergents, um, and then different techno technological advances, such as spotted on. We've also seen back it off, uh, the chameleon. Also, there's the Leica GP2, and there's a myriad of issues. And so I'll leave this portion um, to the Q&A, and hopefully I've probed you guys and gotten you guys excited about um, uh, the discussion portion of today. Uh, and with that, I would like to pass the torch to, to Will. <laughs>